tell you, no matter what people say in a poll like that, when it comes down to, their, to dangers or their health, everyone realizes science is the way to go. I mean, take the avian flu. Okay, President Bush may have, said, may have said both sides of the debate should be discussed. But when the avian flu came up as a threat, he, like everyone else, said we have to find out how fast it's mutating from birds to humans so we can attack it. You didn't hear one person say, you know, it's been designed to kill us, just give up. Okay? We have an inherent understanding that in, in situations like that, we have to depend on science. And we owe it to our children to give them the best science preparation we can give them so they can compete in the 21st century. It is our economic future. Science is a vital part of public policy, and people have to recognize that. And that is one of the reasons why I and several other people got involved in, in, a, in a proposal which uh, has been building with great force to have a debate, a presidential science debate on, on science and technology policy. I've, I've read this in a number of places, and I haven't verified it, so I, I must admit, I, I, I say it with some trepidation. But apparently there was a study in 2007 of the 2,679 questions that TVS networks asked about presidential candidates. Of these questions, only three were about global warming, apparently. I've seen this in four different places. I can't verify that it's right. But apparently that's the same number of questions that were asked about UFOs. Now, this has caused a number of us, and a number of concerned citizens, not scientists, in fact, my co-organizers in this involve two screenwriters and, science, and two science bloggers, uh, science journalists. And it is amazing to me. I wrote a piece in the Wall Street Journal in, in December 6th. And since then, this has been sponsored by, and, and by almost every major organization you can matter. And I, I certainly hope the American Enterprise Institute will become one of these organizations. The American Association for the Advancement of Science, the Council on Competitiveness, the National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Engineering, the Institute of Medicine, a hundred leading American universities and other organizations, about 60 university presidents, 20 Nobel laureates, and now 14,000 concerned citizens, including science journalists and legislators, have signed on to endorse this most recently. Well, and that we are all concerned that candidates' views on important policy issues, key important policy issues, are not being heard. To just today, Craig Barrett, the, the chair of Intel, signed on with a very strong statement about, about how we need to discuss science and technology policy if we're going to move forward in this country. And um, I want to emphasize, this will not be a science quiz. We're not going to ask what the seventh digit of pi is. Okay? <laughs> this is, a, a, we hope, to have a nonpartisan debate in which candidates, we want to know whether candidates have thought carefully about the public policy issues and what forms are, informs their thinking about issues that are important, biofuels, which we just learned, of course, a lot of people are claiming we should be using biofuels, but as you know, recent evidence has been suggested that in fact they're worse for global warming. Manned space travel, a lot of people talked about the need to go to Mars. Well, what does that do for science? What does that do about unmanned satellites, for example, unearth monitoring satellites, which are important to study global warming, where, in f where, the, where the costs are being, where those programs are being cut in order to produce manned space travel. We, what about nuclear power? What about waste associated with nuclear power? What about uh, the, the financial viability of nuclear power versus, say, conservation? And what about American competitiveness, which I'll get to at the end here? And I want to give you some news. Just today, we've invited officially all four candidates, remaining candidates, to a debate which will be held on April 18th, 2008, in Philadelphia, and it's going to be hosted by the Franklin Institute, which seems an appropriate place to host it. Benjamin Franklin, uh, one of the first great American scientists, to give you another plug, Walter. Um, and the debate will occur if at least one candidate accepts. That, that informal invitation has now gone out, and, um, and we hope that all the candidates will accept. And um, we shall see. And when we get to American competitiveness, this is the last concern. As you probably know, in the omnibus budget passed by Congress in December, all of the American Competitiveness Indicate, uh, 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 Act uh, mandated increases in the physical sciences were removed. It's the fourth consecutive year of decrease in funding for basic research. This will produce, and already has, furloughed people at a, 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 about 10% of the workforce at our major national laboratories. We've cut funding for the International Fusion Project, which we committed to. What does that do for our future international collaborations? And what funding remains is, is targeted for near-term applied research. And I want to point out the need to do basic research for our economic health. The example I picked is this one. You may not recognize it. It's from 1946. It's the ENIAC computer, which is a program plug-in board switch computer. It was the fastest computer at the time, 
5,000 times faster than any computer before that. In fact, it, it did 5,000 operations per second. Now, if we had invested money in building better computers at that time and told Bell Laboratories, we want you to build better computers, we would have built machines that had faster cranks and wheels. Okay? What we did instead is we said, we want you to be free to investigate what you want and look at the quantum mechanical properties in nature. And what happened? They invested, invented transistors. And the transistors now produce the most modern computers, which are approximately 1,000 billion times faster than that computer. Investments in fundamental research are responsible for the health of our economy today. And the investments that were not made last year, but 50 years ago. And if we don't invest in fundamental research now, our children will suffer because of it. And so, but I do want to conclude not with the autonomy. Because I don't want to make it seem as if science is just relevant for its technology. The universe is a remarkable place without all the junk. It is a truly remarkable place, and I believe the benefits of science are not just the ancillary technology, not just building a better toaster. I would argue we remember the Greeks and the Romans not because of their plumbing, but because of their ideas. And science brings wisdom by bringing knowledge, and more importantly for me, it brings wonder. And that is the real reason to support science in my mind. And I believe we need to be willing to accept the universe for what it is, without fear, to build a truly just society and a safer and more secure world. And in that sense, science is not the enemy. And I should say, faith is not the enemy. Ignorance is the enemy. Thank you. And I'm going to leave this up there, and you can ask me what that is. Thank you very much. Do I, I will, I'm happy to take questions, and I assume I moderate them myself. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Krauss. Uh, my name is Frank Fletcher. My question is fusion. What can you tell us about the future of fusion, and what are the barriers to making it viable, and specifically, and might it be overcome? Well, might they be overcome? There's a famous statement about fusion that it's 25 years in the future. It was 25 years in the future, and it will be 25 years, years in the future. It is extremely hard to, we can create, as you know, uncontrolled fusion explosions, we call them thermonuclear weapons. Fusion is extremely difficult uh, and, and, and expensive. And that was why, ultimately, it was decided to have an international collaboration, ITER, with an international competition, so that all countries could put together a single program to try and get controlled fusion devices. And, um, the people working on that program are optimistic. I have no idea whether fusion is around the corner or not. And if it is, I should say, I don't have any idea if it'll be economically viable. In my opinion, one of the big issues with nuclear power is not so much the dangers of nuclear power, which I think can be overcome largely with good engineering and good safety controls. It's the question of whether investing in huge central um, power plants that may require 10 or 20 years worth of capital investments is the way to go in the current uh, environment. And so it's not clear to me that fusion will f be financially viable. But one thing is clear is that if it becomes viable, it is so profoundly useful because, of course, the byproducts are, uh, are, are not going to be uh, large isotope radioactive materials and there won't be the waste disposal problem, uh, that it is worth investigating. It is a huge challenge, and those are the kind of challenges we should have international collaborations to do. Just like we have the International Linear Collider as a proposal to investigate the forefront of matter, and right this, in a few months, the Large Hadron Collider is going to explore the fundamental structure of matter. These are the challenges we should take. In fact, I really wanted to say something that I forgot, and now you've given me the chance to say it. When we talk about science and its utility in this regard, be it fusion or particle accelerators, I like to remember the words of Robert Wilson who was the first director of the Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory. And he was asked by Congress when that accelerator was being built, will it aid in the defense of the nation? And he said, no, but it will help keep the nation worth defending. Okay? And that's why I think we have to do it. Because we can. Yes? Thanks. Uh, will Salatin from Slate Magazine. I'll pick fights with all three.